This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast, formerly known as the Site Visibility Podcast, produced by the team behind Brighton SEO. I'm Kelvin Newman and in today's episode I'm joined by Danielle Gipps and Carla Rivaris and we'll be discussing how to take your paid social advertising to the next level. Hello and welcome to the show again. Um, I'm joined by two amazing guests um, and we're going to be talking about paid social, which is one of those topics that you know, for us, when we've been organising Brighton SEO over the years, it's been something that we've been including in the show more frequently. We have the Search and Social Advertising show, which is part of the programme. And it's a really interesting topic because it really is one of those areas that feels like um, there's a lot going on. It's dynamic. There's a lot changing. Um, there's new products within the existing providers. There's changes in the relative popularity of the networks and how they've been doing. And it doesn't feel to me that it's talked about quite as much as I think it would. Maybe that's just my kind of like lens on the internet and lens on the world. But I know there's some really great practitioners and people working in the space who are there and are really knowledgeable. And I just want to kind of spread their great knowledge and great experience. So I'm really pleased to have two amazing guests who I know know their stuff around this. I think we're going to have some really interesting conversations about where paid social is, where it's going, and some of the practical things that we might be able to do off the back of that. But yeah, if I could get you to introduce yourself, Carlo, you're right to go first in terms of tell us a bit about you know, the Carla story and, you know, who you are and how, how you've come to uh, be working in, in paid social and talking about it today as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I've been working in this industry now for oof, a long decade, so quite a long time um, at the moment. So I, I paid social kind of fell on me, I want to say. Um, I think 10 years ago, what social was does not look at all what social is today, especially like everything paid. So kind of just happened and I've been, like I said, in it for the last 10 years. At, at the moment, I'm what people would call an entrepreneur. Um, I have two online brands, which I was able to start thanks to what I've learned in paid social, but I still do some quite a lot of consultancy. Basically, I come in and help mostly international brands be able to actually like um, expand their share of revenue through paid social. So I've done so for brands like Gucci, like Starbucks, like Virgin Atlantic, for example, pretty much all across the board. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so. Ah, and it def- it's, so, I don't know if it's like cat years or dog years, but I think in paid social, 10 years of like a- any kind of digital marketing, but particularly paid social, that's got to be at least 20 or 30 in any conventional industry, isn't it, in terms of the, the, the development that's going on. That's interesting, that experience of kind of like um, consultancy side of things, but also developing your own brands. Is that, do you feel that that gives you a slightly different perspective to how you would have been if you'd kind of, just been in-house or just been kind of working um, agency side? Does it, you know, help in that kind of day-to-day process? Well, I mean, I've worked pretty much all across the all across the board. So I've worked agency side. It was the beginning of my career. I worked for a bunch of Group M agencies. Then I went on the content agency side. Then I went on the brand side. And then I went on the influencer marketing agency side. And once I did all of that, I remember thinking to myself one day, if I can help a company sell tires for sure, I can try to sell my own product that I'm actually passionate about. So it's kind of where it came all about. I don't know if I would have had the confidence to do it if I didn't have like such a broad scope across everything. I think even in terms of consulting and freelancing, whatever we want to call it today, without having like this full scope, it would have been a bit, I think, I don't I don't know if I would have had the confidence at that stage. Um, but yeah. It's oh, a yeah. very, it's a very, I mean, and I, I like, I don't know about Daniel or about yourself, but I think also like whenever you have sort of your own, whenever you're trying to run your own shit, whenever you're trying to run your own little startup, it's a lot more than the digital marketing. And it took me a lot of failure and <laughs> a lot of years to realize there's so much more around it than just trying to put the right product in front of the right people. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by the different journeys that people have to end up in their kind of career. And it's like, I mean, it's probably a subject for a whole other additional podcast that you could probably do just on that topic. But I think there's kind of these routes that people take and then the experiences that they have that lead them to where they are. It's, yeah, that's kind of a very unique thing about when you're trying to find people. And yeah. So, so Daniel, how about yourself? What's your kind of journey to, to, to where we find ourselves chatting today? Yeah, well, you mentioned unique journeys and <laughs> I think mine probably couldn't be more different maybe from from where Carla is so um I 
don't necessarily have a traditional background in marketing. My, I didn't go to university to do marketing, I actually studied performing arts. Um, I spent time as an actor and as a writer and then kind of just needed a proper job in quotation yeah. marks. Um, <laughs> so when, went into marketing, I have only worked agency side. So all of my experience has been agency side and I just kind of learn as much as I could. I've been in marketing for about five years now, just, um, networked, asked loads of questions, reached out to people who were in marketing positions at brands that I really admired, kind of tried to absorb as much knowledge as I could. Um, and I'm now a marketing manager at, at an agency. Um, and I'm very much a champion of, of brand, of brand building, um, using paid advertising to, to amplify brand awareness um reputation and that kind of thing i think it that then falls on to kind of the more traditional like performance marketing that you're used to hearing about when it comes to paid social um and ppc and all of that kind of thing but um, i'm very much kind of sitting at the top with my eyes over strategy as a whole um and kind of trying to encourage more marketing teams to maybe go back and and think about what marketing was maybe 15, 20 years ago when it was all about brand um, and kind of your brand message and and trying to get yourself in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Um, but yeah, very, very different from Carlo. I would still kind of class myself as being quite inexperienced. Um, I've only worked at two agencies, obviously with a lot of brands within those two agencies, but I've not kind of dipped my toe in all of the ponds. I've just kind of found what I loved and then and then ran with it so ah that's yeah. great to hear and i mean i think it is really there is this kind of one of the things i do like about paid social as kind of a discipline is this kind of it feels like the barrier to entry is really low but kind of the there's the the ramp of like the difficulty of it goes up as well right if that makes sense so it's kind of there's not just this kind of it's yeah it's open in as much as like it feels like there's scope for people to experiment to try things out and like test and learn um, but it's not just like you turn it on and it's done. Like there's, you can continue, there's lots of opportunities to, to be doing new stuff. And I'm, I was really interested kind of, yeah, Danielle was kind of chatting about that kind of like building, like building brands via paid station. I think we'll probably come to some of the more performance led and lead gen sort of side stuff, maybe a little bit later in the conversation, but I'd love to know about kind of some of the areas or some of the things you think a brand if someone's who's listening is a brand side or working on brands on behalf of an agency some of the things they might like to think about in terms of brand building using paid social what some of the formats some of the techniques any kind of you know it's an open huge open question but like if you're kind of tasked with this like well how do you build a brand in uh, using paid social what are some of the things that would immediately be on your list of things that you'd be thinking about and considering yeah, well, I always use um, this analogy when I talk about paid social I think some brands uh reluctant to a certain extent to use paid social at the top of the um, funnel because they think it's a performance-based uh channel but i always use the analogy that paid social acts as an invitation to your party so you know it's sending invites out to thousands of people that might not have heard of you and then as those people receive those invitations and they get to learn more about your brand through your organic content you know, your organic content is, you know, the food that you've got at the party and, you know, the music and the vibe and, you know, what, what that feels like when you actually arrive, but no one will turn up to your party unless they've received an invitation. So that's kind of how I like to explain it. I think brands, especially within e-commerce who have maybe had a really strong 12 months straight out of the gate, but they've exhausted kind of all of the people who are already interested in buying their product if they're looking to acquire new customers at scale and people have never heard of you using paid social as a brand building tool can be really effective it's a visual channel um and you know i know from being an actor and a writer that the way to connect with an audience is through emotion the best way to to portray emotion is is visually and, and audibly so what a better platform than than the paid social channels that rely so heavily on on visual and, and audio um and 
you know, you can be playful with it. You can be creative with it. You can establish really quickly a brand's tone of voice and who their audience is through using paid social. And I think it's, a, a say, a really nicely displayed invitation to your party to people who might not have received that invitation through, you know, Google searches and all of that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. And, and Carly, you were talking about kind of brands like Gucci and all that kind of thing, that, and obviously your own brands that you're working on. Is there, you know, is there particular things about paid social that make it good for brand building or areas that make it challenging or things that you found like, yeah, approaches that you might want to take to paid social? Or, or do you find that people aren't thinking about that and they sh or they should be thinking more about that? I think particularly when you speak to brands, regardless of the caliber of the brand, there is a lot of misconception around what paid social is about and how it actually works. I don't know if Daniel has had this um, experience as well, whenever you're actually like chatting to clients, is that a lot of them actually don't particularly understand how paid social works and what it actually does. So like, there is sort of like this big misconception that it's like just organic on steroids or like, I put a little bit of money here and I put a little bit of money there. And then like, eventually people will see it. But like the the actual strategic side of how it works is something that most brands just absolutely don't take into account so whenever you work as an agency it's going to be incredibly frustrating like I've, I've seen and i've been in these situations i think something as well that a lot of one thing that i try to like push a lot of companies and 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 even agencies that i work with to actually look into is actually diversifying and making sure that paid social is not just meta there's so much more than meta out there and to depending also on who you're speaking to and who you're trying to target and what you're trying to get people to do um and and yeah like it's it's such a wider scope and like daniel was saying as well some a lot of and i feel like so many brands so many big brands have been trying to push that out there as well but a lot of companies tend to still not understand the fact that content is a ginormous part of paid social performance. So like everything when it comes to content strategy and the content that you need, depending on where you are on that funnel is also incredibly important and way too many times. And I will not name and shame certain big companies that I've worked with, but there is sort of this misconception of that. Oh, we've, we've spent a million dollars on this campaign for out of home let's just flank it on paid social ads. Well, it doesn't really work like that. And for, I, I wish it did, but it doesn't. <laughs> and when you're talking about content there, do you mean kind of the ad creative? So like, I mean, yeah. ad creative maybe is like, yeah, part of the problem, right? Referring it to that way. So you're kind of thinking that you could repurpose an outdoor advert. It's like actually, yeah, it's being the ad formats that you've got on social media are perhaps more like content. Is that sort of what you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, I, because I, I, what, what you need to have to think about as well is like depending on where you are on that funnel, especially for the top of the funnel, if let's just say you were someone who were to be served an ad on Instagram or even on TikTok, let's say, most of the time, like that, you will basically just, someone will just be scrolling on their feed and then you do not want something that either clashes too much of what they're seeing, but you obviously want to be able to grab someone's attention. So even in terms of like how, and I've been on shoots before, like even on how something is shot, most of the times, if something has been shot for a billboard, for example, it literally just will not resonate on a small phone screen on like on a square format or like it's simply not been made to even though it's been a repurpose, it might not catch someone's attention in the first zero point whatever nanosecond that you have to grab a customer's attention. So, yeah, I think these are a lot of a lot of elements, but I think also to, to get back to your question. I've seen that I, I've t I've turned a bit of a focus on premium brands in the last couple of months, and a lot of them tend to think that they don't want to use paid social because they're scared of just spamming customers, or that it's just not to be controlled enough, or like not the right people are going to see it. And that and and same thing. This is also a bit of a misconception that I tend to see also in terms of like more high end luxury brands, for example. Mm. And, and Danielle, have you kind of, sorry, I, I was about to ask you, Danielle, you're going in anyway, so I'll let you go. You go, Danielle, sorry. Um, yeah, it was just to kind of follow on from Carla, what Carla said in terms of like repurposing content or making sure that you've got the right content is, and this is something that we talk a lot um, about at, at my agency, at Revenue Growth Agency, is that a lot of brands who have maybe started in, you know, D to C and they've started right at the bottom they will run collection ads and catalog ads, which we think within Meta sit very much at the bottom of the funnel. A lot of the imagery is like product imagery or it's pulling it directly from like Merchant Center and feeds and things. So it's very much just 
like here's a picture of a shoe or here's a picture of a pair of trousers and unless like if I'm scrolling unless I'm in the market for a pair of shoes that look like that you know you might be interested for a couple of seconds and then you'll you'll scroll on and I think what what brands need to look at a little bit more is if someone's not in the market how do you make them in the market for your product and through paid social you can display what I would say is more kind of traditional forms of video video marketing you know Christmas ads are so effective because they a big brand story pieces and they're so memorable and you, the same could be said for like Cadbury and the the eyebrow ad or the drumming gorilla it has absolutely nothing to do with chocolate at all but they're so memorable that they you know people will remember them time and time and time again and it will draw people in rather than just a photo of a chocolate bar so I think when you're looking at paid social and you're looking at what content you're serving at different parts of that consumer journey you know is somebody who has never heard of your brand before going to resonate with just a photo of your product maybe not so you know have a think about that and and as as Carla said on on shoots and things making sure that you're you're getting content for everyone no matter how close they are to purchasing your your product or your service and I think that can go a really long way um in you know making sure that you're hitting people no matter where their where their mind is and i think that's really interesting what you're talking about kind of yeah the shoot and the kind of formats of bits that might well be you know product photography or video photography is there anything particularly you found like if someone's kind of yeah they've maybe done a bit of that kind of straightforward inventory marketing or all gone the other way which is they've taken their natural um social media marketing and, and done a bit of boosting say and kind of they're they've got those two bits covered and they're kind of going, well, we want to produce some content that's going to uh, perform well on paid social. Any particular areas that like, you know, UGC or like uh, lighting tips or like, any, anything that like, you would recommend for people to kind of go, well, if you're considering this a bit more, yeah. Um, top of the final brand related particular things to suggest. Yeah. I think ultimately it will depend on what industry you're in um, as to, you know, where, where that, would take you um i think for for retail and kind of fashion in particular you know behind the scenes works really well and that's kind of killing two birds with one stone because you're getting all of your product photography and everything all of your e-com photography that you need for your website but then if you have somebody there doing behind the scenes of those photo shoots you're you're also getting good good paid social content i think that can work really well and we've seen that work well for for clients in the past um, I think UGC is still really strong, um, especially if you're um, going to be using TikTok. I think, you know, UGC is still really powerful and also gives you the kind of social proof and the the trust that you need to build with your audience now. Um, if you're getting people to actually like review your products and talk about them in a positive way, I think that can be really um, really powerful. Um, having said that, I don't think that UGC is necessarily for everyone. Um, I know Carla, you, you you might agree with this. I don't know if you're talking to luxury or premium brands, you know, the likes of Gucci and things. I don't think UGC is necessarily needed for a brand like that. Um, I could be wrong. That would just be my opinion. I mean, I, I, I agree with you when I think UGC, for example, is amazing for paid social, depending on the platform. So for example, on TikTok, it's still what works the best. So what someone wants to see on TikTok, they want to see creators content, right? Like they don't want to see an incredibly high-end branded video that has been made in a studio. That's not what someone wants to be served on TikTok. It's just whenever you're scrolling through, they want to see a review, a tip, or like, for example, for a higher brand, it can be like how to style it three different ways, for example, even as like a spark ad, so like with budget behind it and build like a dark post is what works the best. But I, yeah, like on, on Meta, for example, I, I, I don't see it work as well. Um, but yeah, just um, a platform thing. And I think if there's w one thing as well that like, I, I wanted to add from that, I, same thing, I, I don't think I'm allowed to say the name, but 
very like a very well-known sports brand with three stripes uh, <laughs> i can switch for them for a very long time i worked for them for i think a year and a half or something um and something that they actually could not crack for the top of the funnel which feeds back into what daniel was saying was like how to compete with their main competitor right and whenever we were having a look at what the main competitor with the little swoosh brand was pushing out for brand, it actually had nothing to do with the product. But like they would create ads that would actually make you feel like you wanted to belong. Like they would actually try to grab you between the music and the storyline and everything behind it. Even in 10 seconds, they would actually be able to just like grab you and make you feel like you wanted to be part of something. Whereas three strap brand that I was working for was focusing much more on product and how the product is better and how like technicity within the product. And even if you could then go and target, like, for example, an ads manager, like athletes or like people that like were practicing specific sports, it's just pretty not what they want to see or what they wanted to see on social, at least at the time. Um, so yeah, trying to create a story as well is still incredibly important, at least at the top of the funnel, I would say. Yeah, and I think that's amazing because it is, a, and that's good news for marketers. I think this kind of, I think when an advertisers as well, I think it's one of these patterns that I've seen that sometimes people can get a bit bogged down and feel that they aren't getting the opportunity to be creative. And it's really great to hear that what you're saying is like actually being creative, being inventive, being like creating content and, you know, you know, adverts and campaigns off the back of that. That's really important. That's like gratifying to hear, right? Because I think, yeah, like, you know, there might be some forms of paid advertising. Sometimes it can feel it's a bit like, okay, you're just producing another variation of a thing that's not necessarily creative. It does sound that's quite quite a, a, a good trend here. So I've got, we're obviously, you know, plowing through the time, which is great to hear, but I've got a kind of, I want to ask a little bit about the kind of, um, for people who perhaps were doing meta ads or doing Instagram, doing Facebook ads and broadening their portfolio from that. Any kind of particular advice for someone who's in that boat where it's kind of like, yeah, we've got some pretty decent stuff on meta, but that's the extent of their kind of, um, you know, their, their plan currently. Any advice for people who kind of like want to, you know, 2024 um, broaden their, their platform use? I mean, I would look into who, who they're, target customer is and who is actually generating the, the best results for them, regardless of what they're looking into. If it's like booking, phone calls, buying a product, like, and I would personally, I would ask them for data outside of Meta, have a look on site, like who are they reaching out to the most and who is converting the best? Because in my opinion, from what I've seen based on that, you're able to see which platform might work the best for you. Like if whoever is interacting or interacting the most with your company or your service is a Gen Z or a millennial, they're depending on the market that they are into as well. So depending on the country, Snapchat is still a thing, for example, in France or Italy or the Nordics, like Snapchat is very, very hot still at the moment for, 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 for that part, like for, for that demographic. Whereas maybe if your audience is slightly older or like female, Pinterest will be the platform for you to go and explore. It tends to be kind of like what, I do what I advise, like the way that I usually look into it. I don't know if Danielle has other opinions. No, I hundred percent agree. It, it's going to come down to where your where your audiences are spending their time. And I also think you know, be be brave and bold. Maybe with some of your choices, there are still some uh, social platforms that people might not think necessarily class as social media, but they have ad offerings and competition is really low. So the likes of Twitch or Reddit or Quora, you know, they have big, they have a big customer base, a big user base, and, you know, ads are probably gonna be a little bit cheaper and slightly less competitive. So if you know that your product or service is gonna resonate with people that are spending time on those channels, then, you know, test it and see whether it works for you. And if you find that it doesn't, then it's fine. You know that you can invest that that budget somewhere else that it's going to work. But I think you know, Twitch, for instance, has a very very large customer base, a user base who are spending a lot of time on that platform. Um, you know, if you think that some people are streaming on Twitch for hours and hours at a time, um, you know the the engagement rate on the, the platform is really high. So you know, if you if you if you're going to tap into that audience, then um, then test it and, and have a look. Um, so I think, you know, 2024 is a time to to definitely be bolder and, and braver and take a look outside of Meta because Meta's becoming more expensive. 
TikTok is also becoming more expensive. It used TikTok used to be one of the cheaper channels, but as more and more brands start to use it, you know, demand goes up, so the 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 cost goes up. So if you're tight on budget, maybe looking at some of those smaller social channels might actually work for you. Ah, oh, that's great. So one, in fact, I'm going to finish off with like one final question, and then I've got one about the way you know how to keep in touch and stuff. And I've not uh, warned you on this one, so apologies in advance. This is a terrible hosting of a podcast here. But one thing I like to kind of wrap up when I'm finishing off the podcast like this is kind of go, well, what's a particular resource that you might recommend to people? So that might be a book to read, a blog that you follow, a newsletter you're on, um, or a place that kind of keeps you up to loop. And it could be directly related to paid social, or it could be completely random and just sort of something that you enjoy that kind of inspires or motivates you but any particular kind of um places you'd point people towards that like help you do your job a little bit better perhaps and so uh, who wants to go first as always i'll come from nowhere not warned you about it and now i'm not even gonna like let you go yeah um, <laughs> um, Carly, you're feeling like you can you've got yeah I, to be completely honest like this ties with what Daniel was just talking about i personally don't really look outside for 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 inspirational advice but like i look into actually what I do, what the people around me are actually doing. And there's nothing like actually testing to guide you into what to do next. Or basically like these are like, like, how, like, like, like I was saying, like you can, like I, I go to and like Danielle and yourself, like I attend events like Brighton SEO. I go, I've, I've spoken at many different events before podcasts, whatever. But at the end of the day, regardless of what you're hearing out there, I personally like the own results that I can generate tend to be kind of like what motivates me the most. And just like Danielle was just saying, if you haven't been testing yet, 2024 is the year where you need to start getting into it. <laughs> like really, regardless of the vertical that you're working under. And the more you test, the more your results would actually encourage you to do more. It's personally, it's what I've been seeing. It doesn't matter if you work with like ginormous brands that like billion dollar companies or like a startup that like literally launched their product on the 1st of January. The more you test and the more you'll be able to see sort of like the results that you can generate, the more I tend to feel inspired. Um, I won't lie. I don't, I don't find like my soul and passion into paid social. I just think I'm quite good at it, but at the end of the day, like it, it tends to be where I personally find inspiration. Um, and, and I think as well, another bits would be particularly if you work within agencies, um, the resources that you get access to within agencies from reps, for example, because if you go down the route of working with smaller companies, you don't get given a rep or like you need to really be like fighting to speak with someone at Meta, at X, at LinkedIn, does not matter. Like having that face-to-face -face interaction and those people's contacts and number, keep them, nurture them, speak to them for the next 10 years of your life because you will need them eventually. <laughs> like I still speak to people that I met when I was 19 years old in my first agency job that used to be reps at Meta and they still help me every day. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Danielle, any, any directions that you point people towards then in terms um, of, yeah, they might like to look into? Yeah, I've got two, um, depending on kind of what tickles your fancy. Um, so North Beam is a really good resource. They have a really good newsletter that goes out every week if you're into platform data. So they kind of amalgamate all of their all of their users data and it will give you kind of conversion rate and CAC data and AOV data for loads of different social channels so TikTok meta but also YouTube and and PPC and things so that you can see week on week changes in terms of you know what the average cost per lead is and all of that kind of stuff so if that's your bag sign up to that newsletter it's really interesting it's also written in a really informal way it's not like dry like a lot of data sources might be um and then my second would be um the guys at thinkbox um which is catered more towards tv advertising but they give you some really good resources in terms of um, media consumption um, across UK audiences. So they get data from Barb, but they also get data from uh, kind of YouTube and what online digital video in particular consumption is like. So it'll give you like an average watch time per day for um, ABC One adults and 16 to 34s. So that can be really good if you're looking at kind of video in particular. And they also do a lot of um, like on-demand webinars, uh, free events. You can go and listen to case studies. Um, so I would say, yeah, they're they're really good if you're looking for kind of more video specific 
uh, data and insights. So I would say they're, they're my two. Fantastic. And in terms of Daniela, if people want to keep up with your work and, you know, kind of see what you're up to, any particular direction? I used to be, I'd say, what's your Twitter account? But like, that's not, that feels like the wrong <laughs> question to ask now. But like if people are kind of yeah. interested in kind of keeping up with what you're up to and, and where you're at, um, what, what, what would be your recommended ways? We'll have show notes as well for the listeners as well. Yeah. Um, LinkedIn is pretty much the only place that you can hear me talk about marketing stuff. Um, so connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I also reply to all of my dms so <laughs> if you have any questions i do get back to everybody um so you know that's the place to go um i'm also uh speaking at brighton seo at the uh the perfect we love, we, we love show. That. Yeah. We love you're that. welcome <laughs> <laughs> um so you can see me on thursday the 25th of april um i'll be talking more about uh tv advertising uh strategies that you can implement into social your paid social strategies um, so it's going to be full of uh, puns and TV stuff. And it's, yeah, it's it's going to be fun. So I'm really looking forward to that. And how about yourself, Carla, as well? It's pretty much the same thing. Well, you can yep. find me on LinkedIn. I do make it a, a to-do every day to answer back to a, every comment or every DM that I get as well. So follow me on LinkedIn, speak to me on LinkedIn. I've, I'm trying to dabble into TikTok, but that's more to share. So like what I do on my day-to-day -day as a an entrepreneur with a few failed businesses and a trillion ideas that come from my head every day. But I'll say the place is LinkedIn and I'll also be at Brighton SEO speaking as well on the 25th of April. And I'll be speaking about um, the importance of AI and meta. So how to leverage everything that's happening on the AI, AI scene at the moment, make sure that we never get replaced, obviously, because I know it's a bit of a fear of everyone is AI going to be taking my job. Most likely it won't, um, but you need to learn how to basically work with AI on those platforms. And that's what we'll be talking about. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, that thanks so much, for both of you, for your time. I've learned a lot there. And I think that's been, yeah, hugely motivational. I think we'll encourage people to, yeah, think about uh, paid social in perhaps a slightly different way. So thanks very much for your time on that side of things. And yeah, do keep in contact, everyone. And yeah, we will see you in future shows. And thanks very much for listening. And thanks, you guys, for being part of the, the show today. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me. me. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode of the Internet Marketing Podcast, produced by the team behind Brighton SEO, the world's largest specialist digital marketing conference covering SEO, PPC, paid social, web analytics, and content marketing. If you want to find out more about us and the show, you can check out the website, internetmarketingpodcast.org. And if you've um, not already subscribed to the show, you should hit that subscribe button. And can I ask a favour if you are subscribed and you're enjoying the show, can you leave us a review wherever you're watching or listening to the show? And if you want to get in touch, um, become a guest on the show, or just generally feedback about what we're doing, you can always email me. That's kelvin at brightonseo.com. So K-E-L-V-I-N at brightonseo.com. Or of course, you can contact me on social media. So at LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, my usernames are Kelvin Newman. See you soon.